the year and people always talk about resolutions and it gets so hackneyed and so stereotyped and so boring. But, um, you know, what I've been thinking about actually is this beautiful phrase that I remember from my childhood growing up Jewish. And it was something from the Talmud. And, um, you know, not so long ago, I read this kind of riff and it's not even attributed. I didn't even know who did this riff, but it's kind of a riff on that wisdom from the Talmud. And I, I really love it. And I think it speaks to my situation, maybe all of our situation right now. So I want to just share this with you. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. So I, I think it's a very bhakti um, viewpoint, you know, that, that uh, it's my dharma to act in this world in the best, show up in the best ways I can. Um, but um, this work has gone on before I was here and it will continue to go on after I'm gone. We're all here. You know, we're just like, I've been also thinking that we're just uh, time travelers. We're just walking through space and time. And I'm here for a few moments and let those moments be an offering from, from my heart. Let, let those moments be sacred and let, my, let those moments be an offering of, of love and a, and a gift. Um, what is that? Yeah, uh, every, every human exchange is either a gift of love or a cry for help. So let me, let each one of these moments be, be a gift of love. Um, in the best way I can, just showing up. That's kind of what I've been thinking about on the last last day of 2020, last moments of 2020. Um, it's been difficult, difficult year, so much death, so much suffering. And, you know, we don't know what tomorrow will bring. Um, yeah. Cora, you want to comment on that? I mean, you know, we're all hoping for better days to come, but I think, I think the bhakti perspective is that there's a healthy pessimism for things of this world and a healthy optimism um, in terms of things of the eternal world, that I'm a spiritual being, and that is my optimism. I'm, I'm walking through this world as a time traveler, a space traveler, but I know that I'm an eternal spiritual being, a, a tiny spark of divinity. And um, so that's my optimism. My pessimism is, yeah, that's the nature of this world, that there will be suffering, that there will be um, birth, there will be death, there will be suffering, there will be aging. Um, yeah. What do you think, Gora? Yeah. Uh, I've heard more than one person say that this year was a decade. Oh. <laughs> and my kids, it's funny because my kids, uh, I guess there was some sort of meme or something going around. Memes are really popular with their age group right now. Um, going around saying like, I can feel it. This is the year 2020. It's all going to come together this year, you know, like this is before this, like in 2019. And now my kids are like, oh my God, was that wrong? <laughs> like, <laughs> I saw this photograph of um, kind of like the year in photographs, award winning photographs. I guess it was from The Guardian, maybe. And there were these two 18 year old boys during a, one of the big lockdowns in England. And they had their bed pushed up against the front window of their house and they were just laying there with their heads pressed up against the glass looking out at life because they couldn't go out and it was like the, they're 18 years old you know like you know they, they want to be out and about and doing things and I just I was talking to Benji about that like I'm so proud of my kids for how they've been doing this year if this had happened when I was a teenager, I don't know what 
I, I mean, I really mm -hmm. would not have done very well. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, there's a few topics that we thought to spend time about and, and please know that this is your time. Um, you know, we want really the main goal of this Sangha uh, each month is to start the practice of having a time that we can check in with each other and, 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 and discuss what's on our hearts, what's on our minds. Um, my mom and I are always reading things and learning things, and it's an opportunity to share some of that. If you have any questions or thoughts, um, just to make it manageable, we're going to start the culture of just drop them in the chat here on Zoom so that we can kind of grab them. But any, you know, anything that you want to share, any questions or anything, and then we will open um, open outside of just this kind of conversation um, towards the end of our time. Um, so, so, yeah, just time, time is such a fascinating thing in the bhakti tradition. You know, one of the descriptions of the spiritual world, according to a poem, this very grand epic poem that was found in this kind of secret ancient temple in South India called the Adi Keshava Temple. Sri Chaitanya found this poem like buried in some um, some sort of like a, like storage room or something. And this poem is attributed to Brahma, the, the archangel of creation. So in the Bhakti tradition, um, all the functions of the universe are all given to other people, right? Krishna just plays his flute and dances and like yucks it up and has a party all the time. Um, and all the things that happen are all done by other people, you know? Um, you know, that's why Krishna only has two arms. He doesn't have to do stuff. He just basically dances and snacks and plays and, you know. So um, the archangel creation of this material world happens through the agency of this archangel named Brahma, who has been given that that you know all the powers to do that and he says one of the things he says in his meditation so it's to, to, to diverge for a second here brahma creates this material world as a meditation on the spiritual world which is a really fascinating thing to me because we see this world sometimes as this weird dichotomy of simultaneously it's so beautiful you know, even ugly things are so beautiful, isn't it? Like if you can step out of some horrible situation and just look at the beauty in it, it's incredible. You know, even like, like for example, a twisted car wreck, it's like horrible and frightening. And then at the same time, it's like beautiful somehow, you know, it's just the world is like that for me all the time, you know? Um, so Brahma says... One of the things that Brahma says, so he's, he, he, he creates this world as a manifestation and manifestation on the divine world. And um, I apologize. Just one second. Let me find downstairs. No, no worries. Sure. Oh, sorry, Robert. We got you in this call here. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Uh, let me turn the video off. I'm, I'm, the audio, I'm very sorry. Excuse no me. No worries. It's all good. It's all good. So one of the things Brahma says is he says that in the spiritual world, Time is conspicuous by its absence. And, and Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, time I am the destroyer of universes. So you've got this really interesting relationship with time in the Bhakti tradition where in the material realm, time is just this, these, these crushing teeth that are just pulverizing everything. It's like everything's flowing, you know, irresistibly toward this crushing time. But in the spiritual world, the only way you even know time exists is because it's not there. <laughs> I find that, I just find that a very interesting dichotomy in, in the, in the, you know, so like you're saying, um, you know, and sometimes, sometimes some pastime happens. Like I was reading something, and sometimes some pastime of Krishna and his friends happens in the spiritual world, but then they forget that it happened, 
and it happens all over again because there's not this um, kind of hackneyed sense of, oh yeah, been there, done that. So it happened, but then it happens all over again and everyone sees it for the first time. As a matter of fact, it's described that every time Radha sees Krishna, she's seeing him as though for the very first time. So there's this, um, this principle in Sanskrit, it's called purva rag, which means um, attachment before meeting. But there's this phenomenon that every time is the first time. So it's, it's a very beautiful thing. In other words, every time I say Krishna's holy name, it's as though it's the first time I've ever chanted it. But then there's also this beautiful, I think, uh, tension that... Um, as we're looking at it from our world that, yeah, um, and also the last time I will ever chant it. So in other words, every moment is a gift. Every moment is given to me as a gift. And if I see with an element or an eye of surprise, like a childlike curiosity, if I see with an element of surprise, like, wow, like a child sees, but then also see Every moment could be the very last moment as well. So the, to live in that kind of dynamism, I think, is very powerful. Every moment, seeing it for the first time and, and with the consciousness that every moment could be the last time. Like how would I treat Goravani if I knew this was the last time I would ever be speaking with him? You wouldn't ask yeah. me for tech support. So yeah. I would worship you. You know, you know, so I think that's a really beautiful dynamism. This ties, in, this ties in with something that we were talking about in preparation for this call, Mom, which is, um, you know, the, the relationship between living in the moment, but also recognizing that we are, I think the way you said it is that we are meant for something higher. Yeah, I really love, to me, that's a, a meditation because, um, you know, when, when we get those, what, what my guru Prabhupada calls pinpricks, when we get those pinpricks in this world, someone says something or someone does something or I have some ache or pain in my body or there's some, you know, pandemic or some disaster, um, you know, these are the pinpricks, but then that consciousness of, yes, I'm meant for a much higher life. I, I, I come from a higher place. I'm, meant for a much higher life and i can be existing in that higher life right at this very moment by consciousness by intention um yeah and 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 the idea the idea that also creeps up and i'm jumping ahead a little bit so we can touch on this and come back mom but you know the idea of the relationship that we have with you know manifesting our destiny mm -hmm. our our relationship that we have with the responsibility for our actions the, the dharma and karma yeah yeah it's it's um gora and i have been talking about this one um place in bhagavad-gita where krishna talks about the five factors of action so I was actually kind of thinking about this in relationship. I was on the phone with Patrick a little bit this morning and just in relationship to this idea that I, you know, it's not just a manifestation of my intention. There are these five factors in every action. So what are the, there's the, the doer or the karta in Sanskrit, the person who is acting. There's the instruments of action, the senses. There's the place of action there is, what am I missing here? Um, the endeavor itself, and the, ultimately the, the super soul, the, or super the one soul. who, the super soul is the ultimate factor. In other words, giving permission or not giving permission. Like I have my, might have my greatest intentions for myself or the world, but without that permission, like, um, you know, it, it does or does not happen. So sometimes we see someone with the best medical care, the best hospital, they're at the Mayo Clinic and they, you know, get the best care and blah, 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 and, and, and they pass away. And sometimes someone is alone in the deepest, darkest forest or on top of a mountain on a, you know, 
Everest, Mount Everest expedition and somehow they survived. My husband was reading this book. He was telling me about, I think it's called Exp Expedition by Sir somebody. I wish I had his name right here. But they did this Antarctic expedition. <laughs> I'm in, sure he like, would not be happy if he was remembered as Sir Somebody. Well, yeah, he, so it's something like, <laughs> you know, Laura, you may know this book. You probably, you don't. I think it's called Exposition, Expedition. So he and a, a, a whole group of men, maybe 30 or 40 men, they did this Antarctic, Antarctica, right? Yeah, they went to Antarctica and they had these harrowing experiences. I mean, their, their ship crashed and they slammed into an iceberg and there were man-eating sea lions and you know, this, and they had to eat their dogs, and, and, you know, it was just crazy, and somehow every one of them survived, every last one of them survived, and then a year later, a couple years later, he went back to that place where they ended the journey, and he was just there in this sort of safe haven harbor where they ended up, and he had a heart attack and died, you know, so it's so, it's so fascinating, this idea of the ultimate permitter, the ultimate factor of action, you know, that I, I put my intentions, but then I also fold my hands. So bhakti is, bhakti is a very theistic uh, philosophy, that there yeah. is that, you know, it's not, it, you know, it, it departs from, from Buddhism and other, um, other non-theistic perspectives. Because, you know, we, you know, like I remember Prabhupada when he would make a plan to do something, you know, he would make a plan and then he would say, now let us see what Krishna desires. So there is that, you know, really I make fascinating because yeah. you could say that having given his life totally to service, he could he could make the case. Well, isn't isn't everything I'm doing for Krishna's pleasure at this point? So why wouldn't it be blessed? But he, but he didn't feel that way. He said, "I'm I'm really pulling pulling you know pulling everything I can using my intelligence, and then now let's see, let's see what Krishna." Yeah, and just having this perspective that sometimes, um, well, maybe most of the time we learn through failure, we learn through the experience of difficulty, and you know all of you have those experiences. You've heard people say, "Oh, this cancer was the best thing that ever happened to me," or or that guy leaving me was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have gone here or done that or met so-and-so. Um, I was laughing with my sister yesterday and she was, she's married to our dear most George, our, my dear beloved brother-in-law. And she was with another guy for some time. And she was telling him before her marriage, she was telling this guy, if you don't change, I'm going to have to leave you. And all her friends were praying, please don't change, don't change, don't change. <laughs> because, you know, him, he, he being in her life was like the worst thing, but she wasn't at that point ready to see it. So, um, yeah, sometimes the worst thing that we, or maybe most of the time, the worst thing that we can ever imagine, this is the hero's journey, right? I know, you know, Laura, you love literature. So this is the hero's journey. You know, we have to go, we have to slay the dragon. We have to go through that dark tunnel and before we can realize our, our true identity. So um, maybe this is all where they say, if it doesn't kill me, it makes me stronger. But um... <laughs> <laughs> Winston Churchill, if you're going through hell, keep going. Isn't that, wasn't that? Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, yeah, this year, this year has been challenging to so many of us in 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 like kind of like an unlimited amount of ways i was just listening to a, 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 a i listened to the daily which is a podcast from the new york times and uh there was an episode about this bar struggling to stay afloat through all these things so this bartender who had his own completely insane life and somehow or other managed to make his way through the world and starts this bar in oakland and it's successful and this and that. And now then there's this virus and the whole thing's shutting down. And then he's like, he's like somehow or other holding on. And uh, and then, you know, he gets the, the PPE loan from the government to hold his business together. And he's like 
finally like makes it through and they reopen for the summer and he can like go back to business and like things are and then there's a forest fire and he just was laughing this guy has a real sense of humor he was just laughing and laughing he's just like you know what are you gonna do you know like no one would have predicted a forest fire on top of everything else you know yeah. and you know another one of the gentlemen who's who's one of the bartenders he finally gets it together comes back to work at this is all connected to this bar and then his mom is diagnosed with cancer you know and he just his realization which was so simple but it was so poignant to me we all have this idea that life would stop amidst the pandemic you know that like the pandemic was the thing and everything else would kind of sit, sit down and wait its turn or something <laughs> You know, but but all of us are are having our own little unique battles and and challenges and struggles. You know, um, I know yeah, that me, this. Sorry, I was just going to say this last week was re first time since you know I've been trying to hold it together as a father, husband, you know, team member, whatever for my three kids and Brenda. Last week was the first time I just was like. I'm toast. I can't, I can't do that. Like, I just had three days of just like, can I take a nap again? Like, I'm, I don't, you know, I'm done. I don't, I don't have anything more to give. Yeah. Laura just put something in the chat that uh, happily ever after is really boring. So, um, yeah, you know, uh, what can I say? We're, we're dynamic, active, spiritual beings. They're, um, there is no rest. I mean, it, it, but, but we can go to the place of, of joy in that connectivity, that connectedness that I, I am connected. And um, I think that isolation that we all, the place of isolation that we go to is, that's our, that's our illusion because we are always traveling with, um, with the dear most friend, with the most beloved person and always, you know, I mean, Gora makes it so real. I get, think I get to, um, you know, philis, you know, I don't know what philosophical or something, but that that dear most friend is always traveling with us, has always been traveling with us, waiting for us to turn to him. But we keep, you know, trying to figure it out ourselves. And um, but we can we can keep turning around, keep turning to that person who loves us the most, who not only loves us the most but is the most the all-powerful person so what you know you got a friend in power right you, you know who you got a friend in power who loves you more than anyone isn't that a a dynamic uh um gift you know you've got a friend at the height of power who loves you more than anyone else who never will leave you who never has left you but we go ah, i don't know Maybe someone else, maybe something else, maybe, you know, I'll take a nap, whatever. I mean, not that taking a nap is is a bad thing, but you know. But it, just... it was great. I really it really worked for me. I uh, <laughs> yeah. I've learned I've learned after I mean after you know a few years of being being me, being in this body, particular set of emotions and tools to just trust. You know, there's a Quaker saying, way opens. Have you heard that before? Quakers say way opens. It's just the idea that way, like W-A-Y, right? The way is another way of calling God, like God, you know, the way, it, the light, like the Quakers have different ways of calling it that take it out of like a biblical context, you know, but they say way opens, meaning like if you're present and if you're holding true, and if you do your best, the way will open and you don't have to worry that the way won't open. You just have to carry on. You know, the way will open. But so often we, we think, uh, oh, but that was not the way that I was planning. That was not uh, in my game plan. But, but just to, to be open to that, that new and uncharted um, way. Um, this is a very beautiful space to to try to enter, to try to be held in, I guess. 
You know, it reminds me of, of the kind of fractal nature of bhakti, and it's one of the things I probably love most about the bhakti tradition. When someone is considered like the topmost practicer of bhakti, you'll see them, you'll catch them doing the most basic things. You know, making a flower garland, you know, mm -hmm. doing some simple service for another devotee. Um, and, and, and it's easy to kind of think, you know, like the Zen, that kind of Zen Cohen thing, like, you know, who's the most Zen, the one who doesn't know that Zen exists or something like that. But bhakti, it's a little different in the bhakti tradition because it's not that the absence of knowledge somehow or other qualifies you, but it's, it's, I mean, maybe you can speak to this one. It's more, to me, it seems like more like the deeper you go, the more saturated with love every, uh, every moment can become. And, and we all know the power of seeing things with the eyes of love, right? Even the most difficult thing becomes joyful when it's saturated with love, right? You know, you told me that, you told me this once, mom, just thinking about life, you said, remember that when you're with somebody, if they were to pass away, the things that you would miss most are the things that you find most difficult that they Oh yeah, the what we love about someone is their <laughs> idiosyncrasy, is their, you know, their what makes them them, you know, their own um, quirky idiosyncrasies. Yeah, it's a beautiful. So you know thing. the so the the you know and 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 I think this also brings us to this conversation about the moment. You know, we were reading that Bhaktivinoda Thakur poem together about the moment. Yeah. I have it written here. Should I read it? It's really, really nice. You, you want to read that section? Yeah. It's, uh, this is from Bhakti Vinod Thakur, who was the one who first sent um, books about Bhakti to the transcendentalists, to Ralph Waldo Emerson and, and those folks over in Massachusetts. So this is one stanza from his poem. He says, forget the past that sleeps and ne'er the future dream at all but act in times that are with thee and progress thee shall call. So I think it's, it's a very, um, you know, it's a timeless message, you know, of bhakti. Be, be in the moment and make your offering of the moment from your heart and leave the results up to that supreme um, cause of action, that supreme ultimate uh, cause of action, you know. But, but, I, but I think we have to also make a proposal that this is my desire um, and I leave the results up to you, that I, I want to know you, I want to come to you, I want, you know, whatever it is, make a proposal and then leave the results, results up to that divine person that, you know, you, you, I'm, the, I'm the kid, you're the parent, you know what's best for me, maybe what I want is is not going to be what's best for me. So I, I put this at your feet in a, in a mood of humble devotion. This is my desire. I'm turning toward you, and this is my desire, but you are the ultimate one who decides what's best for me now and, and always. Forget the past that sleeps. Gora just posted it. Forget oh, I wrote, the get, forget. Sorry. Forget the past that sleeps and ne'er the future dream at all, but act in times that are with thee, and progress thee shall call. In other words, I might have completely blown it yesterday, and maybe I'll blow it again tomorrow. But right now, in this moment, I am turning toward you with whatever devotion or love I can muster, and and I'm saying help. You know, help, help me and show me the way, show the way. I, I love that Quaker thing. So, yeah, show me, show me the, the next step forward because I really don't know. I mean, I, do I turn left? Do I turn right at this road? But you show me and, um, and I, I, you know, I pray to be guided by you. There's a, there's a verse in Bhagavad Gita that um, 
Ananya Shintayanto Mamni Jana Paripasate. Yeah, that one's really nice. Is that it? Yeah, that's really, really nice verse. You want to give the translation? Yeah, so I was looking at this earlier. There's actually a question I have for you, Mom, because... Um, oh, first give the translation. I'll, I'll pull it up right here. I'll, I'll pull it up. Okay. Krishna says, but those who always worship me with exclusive devotion, meditating on my transcendental form, to them, I carry what they lack and I preserve what they have. So... That's super beautiful verse. I love that verse. My question yeah. is, what is what does that mean? Those who always worship me with exclusive devotion. Well, it seems like that's pretty high stuff, right? I mean, <clears throat> you know, I don't think I'm there. Who who is there? But you know, whatever my you know, I can summon my best angels, right? Whatever my best angels. Um, are th that are available to me right at this moment. I can try my best and I can vocalize that. I'm trying my best Absolutely. from wherever I am in this moment. I'm trying my best. This is the best that I can offer to you, the best I can muster up from my heart. So please, you know, that phrase, I carry what they lack is so, so profound, you know, that, that, you know, that, that whatever you're lacking, if you if you're trying to serve in devotion, that he will carry what you're lacking and and preserve what what's good that you have. It's so beautiful, so loving. It's so uh, compassionate to me, you know, so caring, so best friendly, so best friendly, you know. Um, so we're coming up. We, we try and keep these sanghas to about an hour so that no one feels like, oh, God, I don't have time for this month's sangha. I don't want to spend three hours on the phone with a bunch of people. So we are we have about 15 more minutes for our time together. So if anyone has any thoughts or questions, especially with a small group, please um, let me know. Um, you know, because we want we want. <laughs> as much as possible for you guys to leave this time together nourished. You know? Bhakti is definitely something that is not practiced in a vacuum. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Because, you know, like everyone's talking about social distancing, but actually that's a misnomer because we are social beings and we should call it physical distancing. Um, because we need, um, we are social beings and we need each other and we need to be gifted by the presence of others. So let's just change the term and call it physical distancing. But, you know, whether it's by Zoom or by, uh, you know, somehow or other, we need to be in Sangha with uh, people who feed our souls, right? Yeah. So, you know, We don't, none of us know, this is a question for you, mom. None of us know what 2021 is going to look like. Um, and one thing that always confuses me about prayer is kind of like, and they, there are plenty of Hollywood movies that have made jokes out of this, but it's like, which prayer is God going to listen to? You know, <laughs> you know the, the prayer of the Germans or the prayer of the English. Right, right, right. Right. What is that? Uh, uh, both of us are praying day and night. Uh, I see. Oh, both read our Bibles day and night, and I read black and you read white, right? Or the, yeah, the Germans are praying for success in battle. The Allies are praying for success in battle. So, so, so for 2021, what happens if my prayers aren't answered? How, how do I bring that into dialogue with? living bhakti life if i feel you know i've i've weathered the year you know there's another verse uh in the same i carry what you lack preserve what you have thing um where krishna says um you know for one who suffers through the indignities of life and and just offers body mind and soul then the spiritual world is 
you know, their birthright kind of thing, you know. The, mm -hmm. um, I have it written down. I can't remember the reason. Mm -hmm. but... Yeah, it's 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 really about humility. It's about uh, well, it's a it's a place of faith, and it's a place of. What if next year? What if next year sucks again? Like, how do how do I bring that into dialogue? with um, my spiritual life. What I, what I bring into dialogue is that I just, um, I'm a, a person of faith and I put one foot in front of the other and I act in faith and I, and I do the best I can with what little uh, I have, you know? Maybe I have a, a, a bunch tomorrow, maybe I have a little, but whatever I have, I offer it in a mood of humility and faith. And so that verse that Gora was quoting from is, it's sort of the quintessential bhakti verse about suffering, because it, what it says is that just by, uh, by continuing to serve in the consciousness of, of loving, that I'm, I'm serving, I'm trying to do my best as an offering to you, my dear Krishna, or by whichever name you like to call God. And then what the verse says is that the kingdom of God becomes the, the rightful inheritance of a, when someone lives in this world in that consciousness. In other words, just like just by living, a good son or daughter inherits the property of the father or mother. Right? Just by continuing to live as a good daughter or a good son, that inheritance becomes their rightful claim. So that is very, very profound just by, you know, like... I'm not deciding what goes on here. I'm just trying my best to, to act with integrity, to serve and to serve, help others, you know? Like I might see other people suffering. This is my dharma to help in whatever way I can, you know, to help to relieve suffering, to help um, be in the best consciousness I can to serve. And the results are up to divinity. It brings up an interesting point and, uh, you know, uh, Folks, feel free to um, interrupt me if you if you have a question. Yeah, please put your questions in the chat because we you know we want to hear from you also. Yeah. Um, this I think there's an interesting relationship between what you just said between the results and our sense of accomplishment and identity. What I mean to say is, you know, success is so contextual. Do you know what I mean? Like, like uh, if you if you caught, you know, Edison before the light bulb went off, he would have been a failure in the light bulb until the light bulb works, and then he's a success, right? So, like, where you grab someone's life, you can almost kind of say so. In that sense it's really an interesting invitation for us to really release our connection with the results totally you know to to have that in a situation you know to give that advice to someone while they're on their way to success is kind of saying put it off for now because you know eventually you'll be successful but to but as but krishna and gita and in bhakti they say the result just totally let go of the results forever for everything. They but, all... do you, but do your best endeavor. You know what I mean? Right. Give it your, like in other words, someone acting in bhakti should be, um, you know, the, the, the highest performer in a, an office scenario or should be the best professor, the most beloved professor or the most beloved neighbor or the, you know, whatever, because they're acting um, in that selfless way as an offering to divinity. So, but the results again are off, are, are up to divinity. We have a question here from Hemalata. How do we really know that we are doing our best? And how do we do our best without burning ourselves out? Mm -hmm. You want to try answering that or do you want me to say something? <laughs> you'll, you'll be my safety net. Yeah, try say something. Well, I, I think if we're connecting it to what we're talking about right now, um, one thing that this is from my own realization in my own life 
is that Krishna wants you. He wants you involved. He wants your service, but he doesn't need it. Mm -hmm. You know, like he wants it. He needs it from a personal standpoint. Like he needs it. Like Krishna cries because he misses us. Like, you know, I always joke that Krishna is blue because he misses you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, so he needs it from the place of love. But the funny thing, and I've, I've witnessed this in my own life. When I fall yeah. apart in my service, someone, someone just picks it right up. Like it turns out I wasn't that vital at all. And it's really humbling. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, I'm really holding this thing together. And geez, if I was to quit, I mean, the whole thing, you know, and then, and then all of a sudden something happens and you're just taken out and it's like, no one even noticed. It just carries on. And you're like, wow, that wasn't about me. That was for me. Like I was being given the opportunity to serve that, you know. Wow. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Yeah. You know, you just reminded me of something that, um, that came from St. Paul, where he said, he said to be grateful in all things, not necessarily for all things, which is really, really interesting to be grateful in all things, but not necessarily can you, things. Can you are... help us understand what, what you see as the Yeah, difference? like, you know, I might not be grateful for the pandemic. I might not be grateful that so many friends have passed away in the last year. I might not be grateful that I'm, I'm, um, I'm broke or whatever, but I can be grateful in, in that condition because I'm, I'm just um, holding myself there as an offering. I'm, I'm just holding the situation, the, the endeavor, the circumstance, and I'm, and I'm grateful for, for lessons learned, you know? I'm grateful for having gone through this. I'm grateful for the experience, the you know, maybe the tenderness that, that I experienced when I realized that I wasn't the big, you know, big fat controller, you know, my girlfriend left me, right? Maybe I'm not grateful that my girlfriend left me, but I am grateful for the um, more compassionate person I've become having experienced that, that loss and, and, you know, what I've learned and what I might do differently next time. So yeah, I think uh... one. So, so you know, one of the things that was really, <clears throat> you you guys know that this is all connected to our Patreon, you know, efforts, my mom's and mine, and one of the things I really wanted to do for my patrons is offer something that nurtures, you know, the community or our friendships or something. So, so this this the idea for these both the music one that I do with Vish, which is the second Thursday of each month and this one which is the last thursday of each month the idea is to take ideas and bring them into reality so for this bhakti and philosophy thing i really want to communicate and understand the idea that bhakti is not a philosophy only you know that bhakti is our is like a living practice that is nurtured as we as we bring it into our lives in a practical way, you know? So, so I think like one of the things I hope to uncover over time through these dialogues and, you know, this will continue to evolve here. Maybe we'll have guests come on and my mom and I can, you know, interview cool people that we know, or, you know, what, I mean, we we're this is like, we're figuring this out as we go along. Right, Robert. So, um, so, but one, one thing I really hope to get out of this, is that we all begin to understand that bhakti is this rich and vast tradition that is deep and wide. And so many of the things that we resonate, that we hear and see around us in the world have like roots in the bhakti tradition, you know? And, and that the, there are ways to infuse this practice with life. You know, I hope that for this next month at least, right? As we're going into the transition to the next year, I hope that all of us are able to at least dialogue inside ourselves with the idea that bhakti is the pr essential practice of reawakening the spirit identity, you know? And that that's why all these things we're talking about exist. 
You know, that's why Hemaleta's question about burning yourself out, because we don't want to do anything to add another layer of covering onto our soul. Right, right. You know, in other and, words, and, yeah, sorry. Well, another thing I thought of from her question, back to her question, and if anybody else has questions that they, or thoughts or anything that's coming up for you, please. Well, you mom, know, put, mom, before you go back to Hemaleta's question, let me just finish this thought and then, and okay. then okay. So, okay. Well, so, I had a thought about that. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll just pass it to you. Just let me finish this. Just, just, okay. um, so the idea is that everything that we're doing in bhakti and everything that we come in contact with, if we're trying to be bhaktas, is about removing another layer that's blocking us from our soul identity and our relationship with our eternal beloved Lord. Yeah, that's beautiful. And also what, you know, what came up for me when I heard her question also is, I think we all tend to be comparing ourselves all the time to, well, you know, I'm nothing compared to so-and-so, or I do so little compared to so-and-so, or I'm, you know, I'm better, or I'm worse, or I'm, you know, after so many years, I haven't made much progress on the path, or I still have my, you know, so I, this nice quote from, uh, from Teddy Roosevelt, where he said, comparison is the thief of joy, you know, I think is really, really powerful, because that, I think we all go to that place, you know, I should be, I could be, what if, all of that stuff, but, but, um, you know, putting all those external things aside, this, you know, I come before you naked, my dear beloved Lord. I come before you naked. You see me better than I see myself. And, you know, as they say, warts and all, um, I present myself before you. Please help me. I want to try my best, but I can't try in the way he tries or she tries. I'm just trying in the way I can try. And please accept me. You know, so I think that's. Da, we have um, Davad. I hope I'm saying your name right. Uh, Davad is, uh, is saying that he heard Radhanath Swami, gratitude is the symptom of humility. And he says mm -hmm. in his life, he finds that they always go together. Beautiful. Beautiful. Grat yeah, you know that uh, there's another one also that, um, that I love from, from him where he said that gratitude is the, pal is the lobby to the palace of bhakti. And there is no back door. You know, that's a beautiful one. I saw Robert raise his hand. Robert, did you want to share something? Oh, oh, I just I just accidentally muted you after you unmuted yourself. There you Since go. Since time is short for our, our hang, my comment about time will be short as well. Uh, the, the topic of, of time is is incredible. It's complicated beyond our under, understanding, yet very simple as it relates to our, our limited uh, space that we have on this earth. Uh, Rukmini made a, uh, uh, she had a talk the other night and she, and she, and she said that uh, the value of time is that we have the opportunity to be aware of our very existence and therefore the opportunity to be aware of the truth and to pursue knowledge. And that's so extraordinarily powerful and uh, to, 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 to understand that uh, this is extraordinary limited life and that every moment that we have is an absolute gift, good or bad, uh, that it's, that's you know, an incredible, incredible opportunity for us to advance our spiritual, uh, our spiritual life and knowledge. But anyway, uh, what I want to sh share is that Radhana Swami did a talk probably eight years ago and uh, it's titled, Every Breath is a Death Breath. In fact, I had shared that video with you, Gorbani. It's one of my favorite uh, talks that he's done, and it really grabs your heart and, and, and makes you realize that, yes, I need to live purposely and with the understanding that this is an extraordinary opportunity, and we need to live our lives accordingly, good and bad. And I will put that link. I copied the link. I'll put that link in the comment section, and if anyone would like to take a look at it, uh, nice. I, I would highly Beautiful. suggest. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Beautiful. You wanted to read that that um, blessing for our new year, Mom? Oh, yeah. Did anyone else have any comment or anything? Uh, and Andrea has to go. Thank you for being with us, Andrea. Beautiful. Thank Andrea. you, Andrea. We appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Okay. Yeah, here's a 
this is something that Gauravani and I both love. This is from Srimad Bhagavatam, um, spoken by Prahlad Maharaj, the little boy saint. Who, and, by the way, is like, gosh, the patron saint of everything going wrong. Yeah, everything, right. everything going wrong and still. And he just keeps, he just keeps his sweet heart. And it's really almost like inconceivable how Prahlad manages to keep his sweet heart alive. Yeah, through yeah. remembrance, through rem remembrance. So here's what he says. It's, it's a beautiful blessing that it would be nice to close with this. He says, may the entire universe be blessed with peace and good hope. May everyone driven by envy and enmity become pacified and reconciled. May all living beings develop abiding concern for the welfare of others. May our own hearts and minds be filled with purity and serenity. May all these blessings flow naturally from this supreme benediction. May our attention become spontaneously absorbed in the rapture of pure love unto the transcendent Lord. How's that for a new year resolution? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank so, you all so much. Um, thank you for joining us. For thank you so us. much. Um, thank you for your time and your encouragement. Uh, very grateful to all of you for supporting my mom um, and myself through our Patreon projects. And uh, let's see. Um, there's a couple of New Year's things that I'm going to be doing later today. I'm doing a New Year's thing connected to the Dallas Krishna community. So that's Kirtan 50. I think you should be able to find that Kirtan 50 if you search the web. And then friends at the Shivananda Ashram in the Bahamas have invited me to do something also this evening. So I've, we've kind of got two back-to-back -back Kirtans for two different international communities today. Um, the other thing I wanted to share is keep your eyes and ears open and spread the word. Um, I've officially kicked off the um, release of this new song, Compass, which I think uh, my patrons got to hear. It's uh, now going through the machine at CD Baby. So let's see when it gets released. I don't know exactly when. They haven't told me. But um, yeah, thank you so much for for listening and for sharing your positive thoughts. I've, I've had so much encouragement. I really appreciate that. Anything you want to announce, Mom, that's coming up? Uh, um, just, I think everything is up on my Patreon page. So please look at patreon.com slash Rukmini Walker and um, everything gets posted there by the and, grace of my dear friend, Robert. <laughs> please, please, um, uh, mark your calendars and um, you know if you want to invite someone who's not like on Patreon just let us know and we can you know uh, we're just trying to keep this so that it's a little more intimate you know we're not just putting it out on Facebook or something like that so it really is kind of our closer community but if you want to invite someone special let us know and um, of course we'll be happy to accommodate so thanks for that link, Robert. Thank you all for your time. Wonderful to be with you all. Thank you, Aunt Susan. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Davad. Audrey. <laughs> Nanda. Nice to Betsy. see you. Betsy, I haven't seen you in a long time. Robert. <laughs> Betsy. Betsy's my mountain climbing partner. She's out on the beach walking, walking the dog. <laughs> we climbed Tirupati <laughs> together, right, Betsy? <laughs> oh, Betsy's muted. Yeah, I just unmuted. Yes, we did climb. Thank you, guys. It's so good to see you. It's really wonderful to see you. Thank, Thank you, Hamalata, for okay. being here. Very, very happy New Year. Love you, Laura. Uh, happy New Year. All prayers and blessings. Be safe and well, and be so blessed in okay. the coming days of the New Year. 
Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Denise. It's really a pleasure to be with all of you. We love you. Thank you. Thank you, Rukmini. Thank you, Gorbani. We're so grateful for, for these sessions. Thank Denise you. is here. Where's Denise? She's, you can't see her. She's on her phone. <laughs> oh, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> Denise, I would have changed everything if my mom knew it. Yeah, really. <laughs> I would have said something good if I knew Denise was here. But I love you, Denise. And I love you, Bill, love you. and Happy New Year to all of you. So nice to see you on Susan. Bye, Susan. Bye, everybody. Bye, Sarah. Bye. Bye. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs>